On today's program, we travel to the Bristol Bay region, southwestern Alaska. Southeast Alaska. It's a job. It's what we do. It's who we are. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska, Native News, Native Information. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so very much for joining us. Special hello to Roy Big Crane and the rest of the crew at KSKC TV at Apollo, Montana. Thank you so very much for joining us, the good people from the Salish Kootenai tribe. Nice to have you with us. On today's program, we travel to Southeast Alaska. We take a look at the fishing industry. Fishing, a long-held tradition among the native people of that area. And now, as they embrace the 21st century, challenges are coming at them from every direction. We learn about those challenges on today's program. And I'll be back with Southeast Alaska right after this. From Dom Wheel Alaska. As Alaska embraces the 21st century, the issues surrounding the fishing industry are still some of the most heavily felt and debated. It's debated because this issue affects the lives of so many Native people in that area of the state. It's an issue that goes beyond the commercial fishing aspect of putting food on your table. It goes beyond even the subsistence where fishing has been a tradition for ages and ages and ages. Today, the issues are not even rural versus urban, but the issues go straight to the heart, and you can hear it in the voices of the people that live there. The Tlingit, Haida, and Simsiam people have fished for thousands of years. And they had large fleets, Hunas, Angun, Cake, Sitka. All our southeast communities had a large fleet of fishing boats. Right now, the way the, way the fisheries is going, that we're, there's only Two, two or three boats left that are, that are even able to go fishing. Smaller communities are facing this uh, almost extinction of um, commercial fishing. I feel like they are just fighting for their existence. I've uh, been fishing since I was about 10 years old. I fished with my uncles uh, on seine boats. It was a great fishery. It was a fantastic fishery. Some of the best vessels in all of Alaska fished in the Indian Islands. All our southeast communities had a large fleet of fishing boats. <laughs> and they earned a living. The waters of Alaska supply its people with an abundance of natural resources, including the five species of salmon that live here. For countless generations, the native people living a subsistence lifestyle have depended on the salmon to feed their families and villages. Commercial fishing began well over a hundred years ago in the state of Alaska and introduced an economic boom for the fishing industry and the people who lived off the ocean's bounty. Native fishermen soon were harvesting the salmon, not only to feed their people, but to sell and create income to pay for the new costs of living. But over the past few decades, the seemingly endless supply of salmon has begun to slow down, and the first hit by the decrease are the people who first fished these waters generations ago. In the early 40s, I know my father had a purseiner and my uncles, oh, there were so many of the, of the Prisanius fleet. They had big ships. 
big purse singers. I saw the day in Huna when there were 300 sane net fishermen vessels in the harbor. And uh, they fished uh, across Sound and Icy Straits and Chatham Straits, and it was a dynamic fishery. And they had large fleets, Hunas, Angoon, Cake, Sitka. All our southeast communities had a large fleet of fishing boats. And then in uh, statehood came along, the state of Alaska wanted to manage the fisheries, and they did, and uh, things began to change. Uh, they began to do the terminal fish management issue, which was uh, uh, basically impacted our rural community fishermen because we were ocean fishermen. We fished where the fish were the best quality and, and just coming in from the ocean. And now they fish a lot of the fish for, uh, at the mouth of the rivers and streams. Community used to be a, a dominant uh, fishing com native fishing community and uh, Right now, the way the way the fisheries is going, that we're there's only two two or three boats left that are that are even able to go fishing. When we come back, we'll take a look at how the fishing industry is tightening up around the traditional way of life of the native people of Southeast Alaska, and how their communities are being affected. Stay tuned. Heartbeat Alaska. My name is Sally Ash. Uh, we're in Nanaluk. We'll be right back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mark from Scan Home, and we are proud to sponsor Heartbeat Alaska. Scan Home, serving all of Alaska's home and office furnishing needs. Thank you, Scan Home, for making Heartbeat Alaska possible. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Brown's Electric Lighting Gallery. Thank you, Brown's Electric, for your generous support of Heartbeat Alaska. So can I stay for another hour or so? Eleven. Okay, Mom. Let your kids be who they are, but know what they're doing. Heartbeat Alaska is sponsored in part by Chugach Alaska Corporation. With the introduction of large commercial fishing to Alaska, native fishermen prospered through the 30s into the 70s. But by the early 80s, competition with other fishing vessels from the lower 48 and foreign fleets had begun to take its toll on the smaller local fishermen. Smaller communities are facing this uh, almost extinction of um, commercial fishing in their smaller communities. I mean, every one of them face uh, the problems of um, market, um, whether or not they should continue. I would say that uh, the amount of boats that aren't fishing from uh, the 70s and 80s is probably about 80 percent, you know, and, uh, and we're probably trying to protect 20 percent of those native fishermen that are fishing. With the fishing industry and the cost being so low, the fishermen are still out there. They're still trying. Um, most of them have been there for 30, 40 years. And a lot of them, that's all they have done for their, that's all, you know, the type of employment, their self-employment that they have had for years. For most of the Southeast communities, fishing is the main source of income for the people of the region. Any cut in the harvest has drastic effects on the communities as a whole. If you have a small community, your infrastructure gets damaged very quickly by just a very few things happening. So if you just have a few, uh, if you have a lower price overall, or if you have a few fishermen that are uh, highliners, for instance, and they can't, f that don't fish or pull out of there, or if you have quota share that migrates out, any of these things can have a huge impact on a small community rather than a larger one. The economy of our communities are just adversely affected and they are where unemployment is a high rate in the villages. 
the absence of fishing is very vitally important for them to survive a winter, to feed their families. Commercial fishing has always been the number one employment uh, activity for many of these smaller communities. If a young person wants to get into this long line fishery, you're talking of a young person getting in, into debt with a state or wherever they borrow the money to buy the IAQ. For 10,000 pounds, you're talking $90,000. And that's, that's just, just for uh, one fishery. And then if you want to get halibut, the same thing, you're talking 120,000 for 10,000 pounds. Other factors like fish farm salmon and lowered prices on fish continue to plague the dwindling numbers of native fishermen left in the southeast. Everybody's been hearing about the price of salmon, number one. <laughs> and um, almost all of our communities are, you know, dependent on salmon. And uh, so we're up against the farm uh, fish issues and uh, market problems, etc. The price of them in the, in the world market has been going down due to the world economy. What we're finding out is that some other countries are uh, doing fish farming. And when you do fish farming, you flood the market and you have all this fresh fish to sell. And you can sell at a lower price than what fishermen can sell at. It's an operation that cost almost with equipment and everything, uh, half a million to a million dollars worth of equipment. Insurance, it's just a real big, small business. And it takes a considerable amount uh, of time and money and energy to, to run them. And they're fast disappearing in the smaller communities. Added to the current dilemma is the increase in state regulations regarding commercial fishing and the amount of fish each boat is allowed to take in. With the huge lack of fish in some areas, state regulations have even closed down fisheries along the Alaskan coastline. But the problem in the southeast is different. The most inequitable thing about the change that's occurring now with the processors and the fishing boats is a new policy of trying to limit which boats can fish and cannot fish. One company has what they call an A list, which fishermen will, is guaranteed the right to fish. Then they have a B list that has some criteria for that vessel and when they can fish and how much they can fish. And they have a C list of vessels and it looks like in the upcoming season, the B list and the C list will not be able to fish. Processors in the region have control over who they decide to buy fish from. And many of the smaller native fleets have been dropped from the buying platform in their very own communities. Can you imagine an overabundance of fish and because the processors are unable to process uh, the fish and market it, uh, a lot of our fishermen will not be able to fish. Processors uh, like Trident, um, Board Cove, have basically told um, um, many fishermen that they cannot take their fish this summer. Since American processors have begun to practice exclusive buying from outside vessels and dropping local boats, native fishermen are now looking to foreign markets. Markets in the Far East, like Korea and Japan, have flirted with offers to buy salmon. But the only true investor ready to buy is Russia. They are especially interested in the pink salmon harvest, which has always been a hard sale because of low prices on the less desirable fish among consumers. We think there's tremendous opportunity for uh, developing underutilized species such as pink salmon, uh, underutilized species such as uh, some of the ground fish species that uh, that currently are not being utilized and we're taking a look at those things uh, and try to trying to think of creative ways uh, to market those things. Communities largely and at Island um, started to look around and, and uh, invited uh, foreign processors, the Russians, to come in so that they can take um, and um, buy their pink salmon. The issue, of course, is price when it comes to pink salmon. So um, anything lower than 10 cents a pound generally it, or it doesn't make it worth fishing. The state government at the Kodiak Summit with uh, Senator Mikowski and Senator Stevens looking at the whole fishing industry is saying we have to change. We have to be more competitive around the world. We have to be more efficient. We have to seek more markets. The main hurdle in reaching the market is the Magnuson-Stevens Act, 
which forbids any foreign ship or processor from entering within 200 miles of the state waters. Because of this law, native groups would not be allowed to sell their catch, mainly pinks, to the Russian processors. The irony is that no other group of processors are willing to buy the pink salmon from the village communities this season because of low need and demand. The governor, however, feels his hands are tied. The Magnuson-Stevens Act, which allows for foreign flag vessels to come into, uh, into uh, the state's internal waters, uh, only does so when the domestic processing industry, the American companies, say they don't want, they don't have the capacity or intent uh, to buy uh, all these fish. Where the problem is is that the existing uh, processors uh, have said to the governor of Alaska that they have the capacity and the will to take all the fish, but we also know that they don't have the capacity to take all the pink and the chum salmon at the height of the season. So we would like another outlet uh, in order to, to sell and market our fish to the world. By law, by the Magnuson-Stevens Act, uh, which is uh, congressional law, uh, we are not allowed to have um, foreign processors in this, uh, within the 200 mile limit unless there is no other way that there will be processors or buyers for the resource. So the governor of Alaska has said that um, he has turned down the option of allowing that to happen after a review. In our survey of the, uh, of the processors, the domestic processors, uh, they have said they have the intent to harvest and buy uh, all of the projected uh, uh, amount of uh, pink and chum salmon that uh, are expected to return back to southeast Alaska this year. Well, right now we're seeing that the governor has uh, prohibited us a new market. And, and uh, we asked uh, to be able to do business with the Russian Federation and their companies. And the governor under the Stevenson-Magnuson Act has said no, because the fish processors say they have the capacity and the will to harvest uh, and process all of the fish. Well, they're leaving out our fishermen in our rural communities and native fishermen, and that's not right. One exception to the rule may be the community of Metlakatla, which is Alaska's only Indian reservation and falls under federal jurisdiction first, not state, in all fishing matters. They have decided to look beyond the limitations set by the state and pursue a deal with the Russians. This would give their fishermen a market to sell pinks. They would otherwise go without a buyer. The Metlakatla is a federally recognized tribe with land of their own. They manage uh, waters up to about a thousand feet off their shores. And as a result of that, they're a sovereign Indian tribe and uh, they can deal in a government-to-government -government relationship with uh, the uh, country of Russia and the Russians uh, can uh, negotiate directly with the mayor of Metlakatla and they can invite these foreign processes into uh, their um, reservation. Um, I know Russia is one of them that we're looking very closely at. Um, they're interested. Their people are coming and talking. Uh, our response to that proposal is actually that Metlakatla should in fact go back to Washington DC and talk with them uh, and, and use this. This would be a, a, an unprecedented use of uh, of, of their sovereign authority, uh, but uh, one of the reasons uh, that they have this tribal status and uh, they have the sovereign authority and enjoy the governmental to government to government relationship that they do with the federal government is to be able to go back to them and argue that we do need this, we want this, um, we should go forward. Uh, but it's going to depend on not just Metlakatla, it's going to depend on all the fishermen in Alaska. Um, what they would like. I know they all would like to have Russia buy our salmon, but it's also going to depend on our Alaska government. They're the ones that are going to decide that. In order to have a free market system, you have to be able to market to the world. And we have to get beyond this kind of thinking. And we, we have appealed to the governor of Alaska to reconsider his decision. I'm really disappointed with the state government. We've been asking for uh, questions of them for almost three weeks about it and we've had very little response from them. 
And we think that the, the um, state government um, can, in fact, um, give um, these permits so that these foreign processes can come in. Or While the leaders of these native fishing groups work to solve these issues, other plans are in the works to help the communities that are affected as well. We'll learn all about that and more when we come back. Stay tuned. Each week, Heartbeat Alaska brings you great stories from all over the state. And we couldn't do it without the generous support of Frontier Flying Service. Frontier gets our camera crews where they need to go. So whenever you see a Frontier plane, give them a wave. Say hi from Northside. You might just be on Heartbeat Alaska. Frontier Flying Service, covering Alaska for over 50 years. Hi, Dad. Bye, Junior. From generation to generation, the passing down of tradition has been the native way. You never eat snow because it always it will get you tired. Survival in the Alaska wilderness depends on one's knowledge of ancient native secrets. Nowadays we carry this. I always carry it next to your body. It's water. Purity guaranteed. Aquafina. Ma. Jason. Yes. Who else is going with you? Anna and Kyle. And you left the phone number? Yes. Be back before 11. Let your kids be who they are, but know what they're doing. I am an actor. I'm a woman. I'm native. And I vote. And I don't leave it to others to tell me what matters. To me, every issue is a woman's issue. Every issue is a Native issue. Whatever your issue is, be heard. No boxes, no masks. I am Alaska. You are Alaska. Vote. bothers me you know we have people come to Alaska for, for PFDs they spend five or six months here they have a post office box and they they say they're a resident regardless of who is allowed to buy or sell salmon native groups are hard at work in other ways to improve their fishing industry the communities are exploring new markets and options to save the natural resources they depend on what we have to do is we have to find new markets and diversify products, be more competitive, and have better quality fish. I think the option for, for these small communities is to do uh, cultural tourism. Uh, we're good at what we do. Uh, we're also good at fishing. But we need to um, have some regulations that allow people to catch fish, but don't allow them to take loads and loads of fish out of our communities. It's coming out of some economic troubles, and uh, you know we're doing this very carefully, but we're also doing it with, uh, with a, an eye on the, on the future of, uh, of our community. So if we're going to have these kinds of things, the communities have got to be consulted. They're usually the last people to be consulted. And so we're saying, wait a minute, we're inherently valuable. You know, if we're gonna survive, we really need your attention, your help. We need you to, to, to understand that we have a right to exist here. Southeast fishing has taken a turn since its heydays in the 70s, but a change in the industry may also lead to tapping new resources in order for communities to survive. So we're finding other ways of, of trying to boost our economy and looking into other industries that, with our natural resources that we have. And hopefully one day the whole state will see that we do need other ways of making money besides fishing and timber. We need to get back 
to where our communities are tied to the natural resources and our enterprises and our, our workers are all working together. For us to be heard, to be invited to the table so we can protect our grandchildren and great-grandchildren so we can preserve some of our food and our lifestyle for them. And I'm saying exactly what my grandparents used to say. It's not for us, it's for our grandchildren. The Native communities of Southeast Alaska still plan to meet with the governor of Alaska to discuss selling their fish to the Russians and other hot topics. Stay tuned. Well, thank you all for joining us here in Harpy, Alaska. I really enjoy the emails from Canada. Thank you all for, for emailing me and telephoning. We really appreciate it. For all of us here at Jeannie Green Productions, God bless you, and we'll see you again next week for more news from Alaska. Thank mm -hmm. you.